Welcome for the last lecture in Physical Science 102, Chapter 24, Geologic Time. Uh, as I said, this is the last chapter of this course, and we'll be following up with uh, the necessary exams. And let me check for sure. I'm pretty sure we don't have a final exam in this class. 24, that's correct. So when you finish the exam on chapter 24 and complete all your homework, you're done for the semester. All right, so let's, uh, let's share some PowerPoints and get into this topic. Turn the fan on. There we go. Now we're going to share our points. There we go. Make a slideshow. All right. Oops, getting ahead of myself. What I need to do is reposition my inset so I can see myself, what I'm doing. Okay, geologic time and Geologic time is not measured the same way as day-to-day -day time. Geologic time is very lengthy. <clears throat> so, uh, by way of definition, uh, geologists study rocks and minerals. Uh, the structures, and we've covered a bunch of that already in previous chapters, and the processes that occur. What geologists are really interested in is uh, what order, first of all, what order do these events occur in geologic history? And now we're, we're talking uh, basically about the Earth. Uh, they want to know the order that these events occur and uh, how they're reflected in the rocks. And also, eventually, we'd like to know uh, absolute time. You know, when did they actually occur in Earth's history? It's now generally believed that the Earth is a very old, on the order of 4.6 billion years. That's, that's a long time. Uh, humans, we believe, hominids, human-like creatures, have inhabited the Earth for a couple of million years, and that's by some estimates. Um, Uh, we're going we're gonna to look at how geologic time is measured and how geologists arrived at these estimates and the sequences of things that happen in, uh, in and on the Earth. Okay, so our, our discussions should serve to do several things. Um, of course, we want everybody to re be responsible for the Earth. We're basically custodians, and that's largely because humans have the power to radically alter the, uh, at least the surface of the Earth, and for some extent beneath the surface, uh, more so than any other creatures that have inhabited the Earth in its entire history. 
Now that doesn't mean that we can, um, well, actually <laughs> with atomic weapons, we can actually scorch the earth to where it's uninhabitable. So in the extreme, yeah, humans can do a lot of damage. And the big topic on everybody's mind now is uh, global climate change. Um, I think that's, that's probably still a subject up for debate. And uh, uh, whether or not humans are able to, first of all, uh, cause climate change, and second of all, to correct any climate change that we observe uh, is another, those are two other subjects that are uh, hotly debated and um, uh, still contestable. Okay, um, another thing is what we're going to do with this study of geologic time is to show the complexity of the processes that have resulted in today's uh, living systems, collectively known as biota. Uh, we'll take a look at fossils, right, to find what a fossil is. Most people have a general idea of what a fossil is, but, but in the sciences, we need strict definitions so that everybody in the sciences understands what I mean when I say fossil. If I say fossil to a scientist who's trained and not just a pseudoscientist, then that person will know exactly what I mean by fossil. Um, like I said before, we're going to look at relative geologic time and absolute geologic time, uh, how radiometric dating fits into that uh, regime. Uh, and then uh, try to put everything into perspective. Uh, based on everything that we know now, and even based on some massive assumptions that we have to make, right? Because when did geologic time occur? Well, if hominids have only been on the earth for a couple of million years, and um, uh, recorded history is on the order of uh, less than 10,000 years, then uh, most of the earth's history has occurred when there were no witnesses Right? So there's a lot of assumption and a lot of deduction that's required in order to gain the slightest bit of uh, understanding of what the Earth's history has been. All right, what's a fossil? A fossil, fossil is any remnant uh, of something from the past or any indication of uh, past life that is preserved in the rock. Right? So uh, the, for instance, there could be fossilized bone. That would be an actual part of a, a living creature. Um, but we can also refer to fossils as any evidence that they ever existed, such as fossilized footprints. Paleontology, that's the study of fossils. Um, I, the word itself actually, uh, logos at the end means uh, word or study of in Greek. And paleo means old. So it's, it's old study. But we're confining its use to study of fossils because they're old. Um, and the study of fossils uh, is of interest to a number of different disciplines. Uh, different scientists are interested in fossils for different reasons. Geologists are interested in fossils for what the fossils can tell them about the sequence of events and the, the layering of the rocks. Uh, biologists are interested in fossils for um, the sequence of development of species through recorded history and unrecorded history as well. Um, and many of the topics for both of those disciplines are still hotly debated. Now, if anybody tells you 
that uh, science is settled. In other words, for instance, if a biologist tells you that uh, Darwinism is a fact, it is settled science, then uh, you have my permission to stand up in their face and tell them, call them a liar. Because there is no such thing as settled science. Science is never settled. The nature of science is always uh, hopefully advancing, but change is inherent to science. So settled science is uh, a falsehood on its face. Uh, okay, so paleontologists usually combine what we know and can observe in the present day, biological information, and they look at um, fossils from rocks and other rock data to interpret events that may have occurred. Um, we're gonna move on here and talk about how fossils are created. Uh, fossils are preserved in a number of different ways and the way that they're preserved um, can limit the amount of information that can be obtained from the fossil. In other words, all fossils are not amenable to uh, DNA extraction. Right? Some fossils can be um, used for uh, partial DNA extraction of any living creature that may have contributed to that fossil. Um, that brings up the, uh, uh, the, the fictional world of Jurassic Park where dinosaurs were supposedly uh, recreated from the DNA that was obtained in, from insects, mosquitoes in particular, that are preserved in amber. Um, and they rightly explained that when that DNA was extracted, it was incomplete because there's degradation over the centuries and over the millennia. And they replaced the missing parts uh, by using uh, frog DNA or amphibian DNA. Okay, so three of the most important factors that lead to good fossil preservation that uh, maximize the amount of information that we can get from a fossil are that the, uh, the creature or the part of the creature, uh, and when I say creature, I mean, it can be big as a dinosaur, it could be as small as a single cell organism, is quick burial. It has to be buried really quickly. The longer it stays open to the environment before burial, the more likely it is to decompose and uh, degrade its usefulness as a fossil. And one of the reasons is you want the lack of oxygen to be present or actually oxygen to be not present because oxygen, oxygen uh, always contributes to degradation. So we want to bury it quick, exclude oxygen. And um, the best fossils are preserved from hard original materials like bone. There have been uh, discovered some fossils that were created from uh, what, what we term as soft tissue, but they're very rare. And the conditions have to be ideal and very specific uh, to good preservation for that type of material. Most of the fossils we have were uh, derived from hard materials like bone, uh, shells, um, uh, even uh, chitinous material. You know what I mean by chitin. Um, the, um, not just hard shells from oysters, so to speak, but shells from say lobsters, crawfish, in ancient times, trilobites. Those hard materials make preservation uh, much more likely, at least preservation of the form of the fossil. Okay. Okay, what types of preservation are there? 
there can be preservation of the original organism or original parts of the organism, such as ancient insects uh, that are encased in sticky tree resin that when fossilized becomes amber. That preserves the organism. Um, we even refer to um, intact woolly mammoths as a type of fossil. <clears throat> they died and were buried in ice really quickly uh, in areas of Alaska and Siberia. And this occurred from 10 to 40,000 years ago. And for these types of fossilized remains, we can extract DNA. So we can characterize the woolly mammoth uh, based upon its um, genetic makeup and compare them to uh, DNA of uh, modern pachyderms. Uh, we often find shark's teeth and uh, marine shells found in their original condition. We don't find the soft tissues, but these are original remains. And the material of which they were composed is preserved. Um, fossilization can also replace those uh, biological parts with uh, other materials. This fossilization procedure um, uh, leaches out original material and replaces it with other mineral material. Okay, it could be silica, it could be calcium carbonate, calcite, it could even be pyrite. These are common replacement materials that move into the fossilizing remains uh, and um, displant, uh, displace the original materials. Now, the problem with that is you, you wash out the original materials, so all you have left is really just the physical form. And the deductions you make from the physical form um, are limited because you don't have the original. Example, here are some replaced remains. Some of them might be hard to see, but you can see the outline of a bone here. All right, and there's another bone there and a bone there. Looks like a, a backbone here. Now these don't all have to be from the same animal either. Right? Very often what you have is a, is a, is a, a, a killing area or a, a die off area where lots of animals uh, or plants for that matter, are uh, packed down together, and then it's difficult to tell which one's from which animal. But all of these have been replaced. In this example from uh, uh, Dinosaur National Monument in Utah, have been replaced or remineralized with other materials. So all you see is the shape. We can uh, carbonize remains also. What do I mean by carbonizing? Um, if the plant material uh, in particular is, uh, it starts to decay under conditions of very low oxygen or, or no oxygen, anaerobic conditions, you get carbonization. So the structural material of most living uh, systems is carbon-based. So uh, the structure, since the structure is made of carbon, if you leave the carbon behind, you can still retain the structure. Um, but most other elements are driven off and they only leave the carbon residue. So here's an example. Um, these two fossils from uh, coal beds 
right? This is looks like the bark of a tree. And this looks like the leaves of a, a fern-like uh, plant uh, that were laid down in coal beds. If the coal is um, um, metamorphized over long periods of time, uh, many of these structures are destroyed. But what I what I learned from my own schooling. Uh, in, in one particular class, we went out on a field trip to look at um, tailings from mining operations. And uh, for one uh, coal operation, the extra rock was separated and thrown out. And we found imprinted in the rock uh, various types of plants. What happens oftentimes is when you bury, when you bury the organic material, it's it's laid down so you've got uh, rock or sediment here, and you lay down these plants, sometimes in very thick beds, and then when that stops, you cover them with soil. Right, so then you cover them with more soil, and you start to uh, compress them and start the metamorphic process. Well, the plants that are right here on the surface leave their imprint in the soil that covers them. And that imprint now is evidence that they were there. And that becomes part of the rock. So this layer or even this layer below, when you mine it out, and you get some of those rocks along with it, you clean it out later, then those rocks will show imprints from the plant that originally existed uh, when the uh, coal bed was being laid down. Um, this leads us to not just carbonization, which actually occurs here inside the bed, you can still get evidence of the plants. But what we've, what I just described was actually a mold or a cast of the plant in the overlying material as it was, uh, as the overburden was laid down. So uh, if the plant or animal no longer exists at all, it's not there, no evidence. We didn't replace it with minerals, we just wash it away. What may be left behind is an imprint or a cast of the organism. Um, if that happens to be washed away and the organism has, has left a void in the uh, uh, mineral, in the rock, then what may happen is we slowly over time wash in other minerals to replace it and fill in that void with a different type of mineral than the, than the overburden. So it's easy to distinguish between the two. And again, uh, this procedure only leaves evidence of the existence of that uh, organism by the shape and the size, that's it. There's no other evidence that it was ever there. Uh, in fact, you can't even see internal details of the organism. You just see the external imprint. Uh, here are examples of molds and casts. You can detect some, what, at one time were shells. Um, I'm not sure what these are. They could have been, uh, there's a certain type of uh, animal, I think, called a crinoid. That's what that looks like. So what's a trace fossil? Right? I mentioned earlier that the fossil doesn't have to be uh, directly related to the organism. It could be just evidence that the organism was there at some time, like a footprint. That's a trace fossil. 
It's a trace of the animal or the plant's existence or their movement across a, uh, a surface. Okay. That's why we call the study uh, ichnology. Ichnos means footprint. And so if you're studying just uh, trace fossils, you're an ichnologist. Um, let's see. So these traces can be um, burrows, like animals uh, burrowing into the earth and leave that behind to be fossilized. Uh, burrows, borings, similar effect. Uh, tooth marks. Right? Um, so for uh, fossilized bones, very often we can see in the fossil evidence that uh, some other animal has been consuming the fossilized animal. And we'll pick up um, certain types of tooth marks on the, on the uh, uh, surface of the bone that were there before the animal died or as the animal was dying. The, that would be a trace fossil on um, another fossil. Here are preserved um, fossilized um, burrows. Oops, sorry. And you get a Swiss Army knife there to show you, give you scale. All right, so um, what evidence do we have that life even existed other than those large fossils? How far back can we go? Well, actually, the, the oldest fossilized living remains on the Earth are about three and a half billion years old. And those are blue-green algae. Those are some of the earliest fossils of uh, actual cellular activity. And there, uh, we can still see some evidence of those on the uh, southwestern Australian coast. They're called stromatolites. And they kind of look like big mushrooms, but they're laid down uh, layer by layer by these blue-green algae, and they become fossilized. What we notice from the fossil record is that um, uh, if And I'm going to mention this a little later, how we, how we, uh, the process of determining rock ages. Right? But if we follow uh, older fossils, rock, older rocks through younger rocks, we find that any of the fossils that are uh, evidenced in those rock layers, as the rock layers get younger, the life forms that are encased in them. Uh, become more complex. So it, it's logical to find these uh, blue-green algae fossilized at three and a half billion years ago. I mean, you don't have fine dinosaurs back then. Uh, one other useful bit of information that can be gained from fossils, and this is by correlation with present day uh, plants and animals we can um, deduce that with certain types of fossils indicating certain types of animals and plants, uh, what type of environment they are from. So uh, a rock layer that contains uh, fossilized uh, coral says that it, the coral was laid down by animals in a shallow, warm sea. Um, we know that it has to be warm because of the environment required for uh, providing the nutrients to the corals to build their houses. And then we know it has to be shallow because um, corals are formed from symbiotic organisms. 
Uh, you have the polyp, which is the animal. And then within the polyp and in, next inside its makeup are algae. This is a symbiotic relationship. If they're too deep, then the algae die. They need light, right? So we know it's a shallow, warm sea from that uh, evidence. All right. Ancient life occurred in all different sizes, from the microscopic up to the uh, massive dinosaurs. <laughs> but now we're going to focus on microfossils. Right? Interesting thing about microfossil is, um, well, obviously, you can only see them under a microscope. And I have some uh, examples down here. These are fossilized remains of um, ancient organisms. And they can only be seen under the microscope. Um, what that means is uh, usually that microfossils are intact, entire organisms. They're very small, but they are intact. And they, they can be easily brought up from depths uh, through um, drilling wells. Right? Um, we can pull up those rock cores and we can see these fossils in the rocks. Okay, now we're gonna uh, talk about relative geologic time. Uh, in this discussion, we're not yet interested how long ago these things happened. We just wanna know what's order. What's the order of, ha of geologic time recorded in the rocks, right? Which rock, is this rock younger than that rock or is this rock younger than that rock? or is it tilted and what effect does that have on our interpretation? Those types of factors. Okay. So here are some, um, what are considered common sense principles that we use to determine the relative ages of rocks. First is the principle of superposition. Actually, there are going to be separate slides on each one of these, so I'm not going to try to define them here. Just remember, principle of superposition, the principle of cross-cutting relationships, unconformities, and correlation. Uh, and within correlation, we're going to discuss index fossils. So fossils. Uh, feed in to our understanding of relative geologic time. Okay, so now let's take them one at a time. Superposition. Superposition uh, refers to the sequence of undisturbed sedimentary rocks, lavas, ashes, uh, whatever the case may be. The older layers are on the bottom, and the younger layers progressively higher up. That's the principle of superposition. All right, here's an example of this uh, image is of Grand Canyon, right? And what we're looking at here is um, older to younger from bottom to top. So here's a certain group of, of rocks down here. And then we see there are shales in this region, sandstone over here, um, uh, a different formation here. I'm not sure, they don't say what rock it is. Um, and then the limestones. And the youngest of all of these is the, the limestone at the top. Now that's not the youngest rock there is on the earth because of erosion. Right? There could have been a, a whole lot more above that, but weathering and erosion have removed it. But for this formation, the youngest of the layers is here at the top, the limestone. Um, now, there's always a, uh, a caveat 
or a fly in the ointment. If the layers have been disturbed in any way, and I'm talking about geologic disturbance, you know, not like mining and all that, but geologic disturbance, faulting, folding, um, any type of geologic disturbance, volcanic activity, those things have to be taken into account uh, as disturbances and the interpretation becomes more difficult, obviously. Cross-cutting, what is cross-cutting? Cross-cutting refers to the intrusion of igneous rocks into younger rock layers, uh, excuse me, <laughs> older rock layers. The igneous rock would be the younger. As it cross-cuts, as it, as it drives its way into rock, that means that the igneous rock is younger than the rock that surrounds it. Um, that's one type of cross-cutting. Within this concept, we also refer to faults and folds. When the rock was laid down, and, and this, uh, we're talking about sedimentary rock and metamorphic. When the rock was laid down, it occurred in uh, old, younger, 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 younger. Any folding or faulting that occurs uh, in those rock layers has to be a younger event. You got to have the original rock there before you can do anything to it. So the faulty and folding is younger. Okay, here's uh, an example. This uh, dike, as we defined it earlier in the last chapter, actually. <clears throat> this igneous dike is younger than the layers that it cut across. Right? So this dike is younger than any of these other layers. Uh, let's see, I thought I had a slide that was going to mention, and also the fault, oh, it is included, sorry, I didn't read my own writing. The fault that occurs across here is even younger than the dike. So in order, we would say that um, this is the oldest material here, and this is a little bit younger, this is younger, this is younger, and then the dike is the next youngest, and the fault is the very youngest of all of these represented in that uh, image. Now, what's an unconformity? An unconformity is, is any gap or break of any kind in the geologic rock record. In other words, if you're expecting to see uh, this layer, this layer, and then another layer, and then this layer and this layer, and this layer is missing. Now you're going to wonder, how do we know it's missing if it's not there? Uh, there are other ways to figure that out, and we'll cover them gradually as we go. But any unconformity is a break in that record. It's important to remember that nowhere on Earth does the, the rock record cover the entire expanse of geologic time? It is not complete. All rock records anywhere on the surface of the earth are, are incomplete. So they're all gonna have uh, unconformities of some kind or another. These layers may be missing due to the fact that they were never deposited. Right? The deposit uh, may have occurred in certain regions of the earth, but not in your region. Right? Or if they were there, they may have been eroded away before the next layer was laid down. So they're missing. Um, the amount of this time that's missing 
is the real problem. Very difficult to determine how much geologic time is missing. We can still say which is younger, which is older, but we don't always have enough information to tell us uh, what should be inserted in between rock layers, the unconformities. Okay, so let's apply these principles to relative dating uh, in an example. And so here we have a picture, uh, a theoretical picture. There's the surface. And as we go deeper, we have this layer and another layer. We have another layer. And then we have this layer and an igneous intrusion here. Okay. So what can we say about that? Uh, what's the order? Right? Which one is youngest? Which one is oldest? What's the sequence? Rock layer five is above four, so it's younger. Rock layer four is above three, so it's younger than three. And rock layer three is above one, so it's younger than one. Then uh, it's three is younger than one. So five, four, three, one would be the order for those layers. Notice that two cuts through one, right? So one had to be there first before this igneous intrusion occurred. So the order then would be from youngest, to, uh, from oldest, from, excuse me, from youngest to oldest. The youngest is five, four, three, one, and then two, uh, excuse me, uh, five, four, three, Two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. Because one has to be the oldest. And two would have been cut into it. And notice that three is laid down on top of that. So what probably happened was there was some erosion because that's too perfect. So some erosion occurred and then three was laid down. Okay, so I probably should have just gone to this slide and it would have answered my questions. Rock layer five is the youngest, followed by four, three, and one uh, as the oldest. Two is younger than one, right? Because one had to be there before two. So from oldest to youngest, one, two, three, four, five. They're in numerical order. All right, what else can we say about this? Is there an unconformity? All right. Note that the top of rock two, and this is what I was referencing earlier, the top of the this igneous intrusion two is even with the top of one. So it had to be eroded. One and two must have undergone erosion together for that level to be perfectly uh, in sync with one another. Rock, rock layer three was deposited after the erosion occurred. All right. Thus, this is referred to as an unconformity. Um, all right, so we have to qualify our definition of unconformity. Unconformity is not necessarily a missing layer. It can be missing material. Okay, so um, we would expect two to have been uh, extruded through one and into whatever was above it. And if there was nothing above it, then it would have come out on the surface and then all of this would have been eroded away together. So that's an unconformity, it's missing material. That's an unconformity. Okay, correlation. 
What do we mean by correlation? Correlation is the process that geologists use to determine the relative age of rocks uh, from several, from two or more different locations. Right? You want to be able to say if this rock layer is here in this uh, region and uh, it's over here in this region, then they're relatively at the same time. They were laid down at the same time. Right? So we need a way to correlate this rock layer with that rock layer. Now they might be at different heights, but we want to be able to correlate them if possible so that we can match their ages, their relative ages at this point. So if we say that rock, um, if the rock at location A is known and the rock at location B is correlated to A, then the age of the rock B is the same as the age of the rock A. We're not saying how old it is yet. We're just saying that it, it's the same age. And that way we can, um, we can, again, uh, determine where it is in the relative sequence of rock layers. So let's say, let's say we've got um, uh, a layer of rock here, right? And we want to correlate, say, this one. And we've got another location over here. And over here, it occurs there. So we can correlate these two. Right? But now we've got another one up here. But it correlates to this one. Right? So what does that mean? That means if this one is definitely correlated to that one, and that one's correlated to this one, then that rock layer at this location is missing over here, right? In this region here, it's missing. Either it wasn't laid down or it was eroded at that location. So that's one of the, the essential um, benefits of correlation. It helps us identify unconformities too. All right, let's see, I'll be sure I'm still on camera. There we go. Okay, so correlation, how do we correlate? That's where fossils can be enormously helpful. The particular fossils we're referencing here are called index fossils. Fossils that you find in both locations. <clears throat> and to be a good index fossil, it needs to be widespread in distribution. It needs to be found virtually everywhere on the Earth's surface. That would be ideal. It's found everywhere. It's easily identified. In other words, you cannot make a mistake in identifying this fossil at that location and the same fossil at a different location. And those are conditions. And it's also very limited uh, to the uh, relative time scale on the Earth's history. So if the fossil is widely distributed, easily identifiable, and it only occurs in a narrow band of rocks, um, it's limited in time scale, then that is an excellent index fossil for advancing um, correlation of, of rock layers in, in different locations. Um, right, so and that's in black and white, just what I said. All right, here's an example. So let's say we have, um, 
we've got these rock layers at different locations. And we have uh, this index fossil that's been identified. And it only occurs in this layer here. It also only occurs in this layer. Those two layers are correlated. And now we can um, use that correlation to also um, infer things about the other rock layers. Right? In this one, we have a little bit of four over here and here. Five is missing on that side. Six is missing on this side. We do have two on both sides, and we do have one on both sides. So that also helps us identify unconformities. So here's another example. All right, we have four fossils. A, Monograptus, B, Promethea, C, Thacops, and D, uh, Drepanodus. Those different fossils, and those are real fossils. They've been identified. A through D, they're shown in this figure along with their ranges, right? We haven't identified these yet, but the younger one is Permian and then Carboniferous, Devonian, Silurian, Ordovician, Cambrian, right? These are in order of age, the oldest at the bottom. And we find that this monograptus only occurs in the Silurian layers. Phacops only occurs in the Devonian and the Silurian. Uh, Drepanodus occurs in the Silurian and the Ordovician, and Promethea occurs from Permian all the way down to the uh, layer between Ordovician and Cambrian. Okay, the question is, which fossil would be the most useful as an index fossil? If a rock layer from a certain locality contains both fossils C and D, Phacops and Drepanodus, if it to obtain, if it has both those fossils in it, what's the age of the rock? Well, if it's got both of them in it, it can only occur in the Silurian, because that's the only layer in which both of them occur together. Right? But fossil A would be a better choice, because it doesn't occur anywhere else but in the Silurian. Right? They're sort of, um, they self-supporting. I mean, they, they support one another. The Silurian says it's this one. The presence of Phacops and Drepanodus, uh, both in that same layer, also confirms right, that that layer, wherever it occurs with these fossils, is Silurian. But A is the best fossil because it's narrow in its time range. What about a rock that contains both fossils C and D? Oh, I've already mentioned that. Uh, they would also be useful index fossils, not separately, but together. They serve as indexes. Promethea would be the least use <laughs> because it covers su such a wide time range. Um, I mentioned uh, trilobites earlier. Phacops is a trilobite, right? Looks like, um, I don't know, kind of like uh, roly polies. Right. The proper name for a roly poly is an isopod. I'm not sure if uh, trilobites are considered isopods or not. Uh, representations of them give them lots of feet, and they're all the same. So maybe. Um, Trilobites would be considered um, isopods also. Okay, so geologists all over the world have worked to correlate rocks over large areas. And the relative ages of these rocks on the earth have been determined with reasonable accuracy. Um, but they only still um, give you relative time scale for the Earth's geologic history. So for all we know at this point, 
this rock layer could be um, 10,000 years old. And then the rock layer above it could be 5,000 years old and then could be 3,000 years old and 1,000. Uh, we don't know at this point. But we do have names for them. Right? And this is, um, I'm not sure if it's out of your current book or if it's out of an older book. I think it's, uh, let's see, the newest, you're probably using uh, 14th edition. This is probably 13th edition. Um, but this gives you the, the relative um, rock layers. Right? You have this Precambrian layer here. It's the oldest. Then the Cambrian. Well, actually, the Precambrian is an eon. Right? That's the largest unit of geologic time is the eon. The Precambrian is an eon. The Phenerozoic eon is the one that we're in right now. So what does the Phanerozoic mean? I like word definitions. I mean, what, what's the, we call it the etymology? What's the origin of the word? Well, uh, Phenero means to bring to light, to expose, and uh, to make visible. And Zoic refers to animals. So we're bringing animals to light, making them visible. And that refers to uh, the break here between the Precambrian and the Phenerozoic is a time when the complexity of life and the number of species on the earth exploded. It's often called the Cambrian explosion. Right now, within each of the uh, eons, there are subdivisions. These are called eras. So the eons are the biggest and the eras are the next level. Paleozoic is the older one. Mesozoic, paleo means old, meso means middle, and ceno means recent. So it's, there's a logic to the naming. So we have this old, middle, and late. But Cenozoic is the one we're in now. Ancient life, Paleozoic, Mesozoic. Uh, Mesozoic is middle life, but it's also the age of the dinosaurs. So from Triassic through Cretaceous, the dinosaurs were in charge. They were the top of the food chain. The Cenozoic is a uh, recent time, but it's also the age of mammals. So when the dinosaurs died off at the end of the Cretaceous, that opened a window for the mammals to uh, proliferate. And according to Darwinism, they evolved into all the um, vacated ecological niches that were left behind when the dinosaurs died. Now, within each of the eras, we have periods. There are several smaller units. Now, we haven't talked about how we determine which is which, except to say that um, the Paleozoic was uh, ancient life, um, more complex. Mesozoic was age of dinosaurs, and then the mammals, Cenozoic. So that's sort of a generalized division. But within each one, you have these various periods, right? The Paleozoic is split into seven periods. Right, from the Cambrian all the way up to Permian. Um, we go through this region here, which is important to West Virginia. The Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian are also often combined into the Carboniferous. And it's called Carboniferous because that's when the coal beds were laid down during this period. Right? So what that tells us is that uh, plant productivity on the earth at that time was extremely high. I mean, the, the proliferation of plant life and animal life was, was massive. Uh, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was very high, right? Because carbon dioxide is plant food. And all of these 
um, plants in particular during these periods were taking that carbon dioxide and fixing it uh, in their cells. So when they died, that fixed carbon uh, was on its way to becoming coal. Okay, so there are seven periods in the Paleozoic, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, Permian. The Mesozoic only has three, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous. And the Cenozoic has two, Tertiary and Quaternary. Um, tertiary refers to uh, three, Quaternary refers to four. <laughs> so I'm not sure what significance that has, but uh, those, that's the origin of the name anyway. Now, we have relative time established. It's natural for scientists to want to know um, when did these actually, these rocks actually, when were they laid down in absolute terms? How many years ago did this occur? So they started off with this relative geologic time. Um, which was a significant achievement, actually, and is use, very useful for interpreting um, various things about the rocks. But they still want to know how long ago these things happened. Right? Not just relative, but absolute ages. This is particularly important for um, biologists. Right? Because the uh, one of the precepts of Darwinism, um, well, I'll just give them, give them to you all of them. Uh, in order to develop a species, you need an isolated population. It has to be genetically isolated from all other populations. So if you have um, a species that's split into two groups, they can no longer interact. They have to be separate from one another for a very long period of time. And then um, they have to be subjected to different environments because that's what drives their development. And it has to, they have to be isolated for a very long period of time. So Darwinists want to know how long do they have to work with this, with these evolutionary theory. Um, if there's not enough time, to develop a species and that kind of shoots a hole in their theory. Because if the earth is not old enough for these changes to occur, um, then their whole religion is kaput. Okay, so um, we mentioned uh, James Hutton in the last chapter, who is often considered to be the father of modern geology. He was interested in, and studied rock layering in sedimentary rocks in particular, uh, in the in uh, Scotland, and the proposition was that uh, the rate of change that we see today is the same as it was in the past. That's uniformitarianism. In other words, if we know how fast things are occurring, like erosion, uh, deposition, um, processes of burial and compaction. If we know those rates now, we use those rates to infer into the past. Okay, that's one way to say how old is the oldest rock. Um, now, when we say uh, in this statement, when we say uniformitarianism and Darwin's theory of organic evolution became widely accepted, right? That happens in in the sciences. Lots of scientists tend to agree with a position and that's accepted, right? That doesn't mean it's true. That just means it's widely accepted. That's as far as you can go. <coughs> there are many in the history of science, I should say many, there are several uh, theories that were believed to be true. 
but were later proven to be wrong. They were widely accepted at the time. Like the earth is flat, okay? That was eventually disproven. <clears throat> the phlogiston theory was used to explain um, chemical reactions. And um, uh, phlogiston was actually considered to be a type of matter that, that was uh, either added to or lost during a chemical reaction. Well, um, Lavoisier, uh, who's considered the father of modern chemistry, um, proved that this was wrong. It was a ludicrous idea. Everybody accepted it for a long time. Um, even Robert Boyle believed it. <clears throat> but it was eventually discarded because it was false. I mean, he could not explain the um, evidence that was being developed through the use of quantitative analysis. I had a cell physiology professor used to say, it ain't necessarily so, which just means uh, just because you think it's true doesn't make it true. So what do we do when a theory uh, and this, I hope this is a reminder. We should have covered it in chemistry. What do we do with a theory that no longer uh, comports with the evidence? We have three options, right? You can modify it and say, okay, we need to tweak it a little bit so it fits better with the evidence, right? Um, or you can restrict its use, right? You can say, Okay, we can only use it under these narrowly defined circumstances, then it's, it's worth keeping. Um, in physics, uh, classical physics is good for um, Newtonian physics, in other words, is good for explaining how things happen um, in a, a range of mass and sizes, right? down to this size, up to this size, it's okay. If it gets a lot bigger than this size, like when you're approaching black hole size, Newtonian physics falls apart. At that point, we need relativity, a new theory. Or if it gets too small, right, um, Newtonian physics falls apart again. And at that point, we need quantum mechanics. So in those cases, uh, we restrict its use and we create a new theory to work the problem. Uh, some cases, the theory is completely worthless. You can't modify it, you can't restrict it and make it useful. Phlogiston is a good example. You just throw it away, right? So, both geologists and biologists have concluded that these geologic processes and biological processes, as a matter of fact, uh, of evolution occur very slowly, as indicated by the age of the earth and the complexity of life that's buried in the rocks, very slowly. And the earth is much older than previously believed to be the case. So what type of tools do we have at our disposal? Well, uniformitarianism only goes so far, right? And the farther back in time you go, um, the less use it has, determining how old rocks actually are. Because if you're off by 1% error in the rate of a process present day, then that 1% is magnified as you go back in time. And you can be off by billions of years. So. Um, we need something a little more reliable. We need a uh, nuclear clock. Radiometric dating is that clock. <laughs> we covered, uh, we introduced this topic in chapter 10. I think chapter 10, uh, section three has the details. But it, it, ref it um, uh, the clock is based upon the rate of decay of radionuclides. 
Like remember a radionuclide is an isotope of an element that naturally, spontaneously um, decays. You know, it becomes something else. It's no longer that element anymore. Um, it is a clock because the, the rate at which this decay occurs is constant over time. At least that's the assumption. Now, terminology. The product of the decay is a daughter. Right? So we have a parent nucleus and a daughter nucleus or a daughter product. Right? We know that radioactive decay of this element gives us that element. So if we know how much we started with and how much we end up with, then the ratio of the two gives us um, a handle on how long it's been since that radionuclide was laid down in the rock. Now, there are conditions, of course, in order to use the ratio of the parent to the daughter, the daughter products have to be stable. They can't be radioactive themselves. If they're radioactive too, then as you form the daughter, it goes through its own process of decay <coughs> and depletes the amount of daughter that's in the rock. Right. So the complications for using radiometric dating uh, mount up, build up over time. Uh, as we try to use them, we have to account for uh, possible errors. So all of this is based upon the half-life. Right? How long does it take for half of the original amount of radionuclide to decay? Right? We start off with 100 units, and after one half-life, we end up with 500 units. After another half-life, two half-lives, we, we have a half of the half. So we only have a quarter of the original and on and on and on. Um, the rate of decay has been found to always be constant for short-lived parents. In other words, um, radionuclides that have a short half-life, uh, we can reliably measure the outcome for um, those short-lived ra radionuclides. If it's um, a week, uh, a month, several years, we can usually be fairly certain that the half-life is constant. Um, the problem is that when you're trying to determine the half-life of a radionuclide, that is on the order of a billion years, right? You only get just a few decay events in the span of a hundred years. So it's difficult. The chances of error for the long lived radionuclides is much greater. Right? So when we say the uh, half life of, um, let's see, I've got a chart coming up. The half life of uh, uranium uh, 238 to form lead is uh, on the order of a billion years. Um, that could be off by quite a margin simply because we measure that half life in terms of years and, and decades in our own lifetime. So, um, just a word of caution. The long-lived parents, there's potential for much, much more error. Okay, the uh, rate of decay, uh, we know this to be a fact, is unaffected by temperature, unaffected by pressure, right? So as you're forming the rock, the pressure builds way up, doesn't matter, nucleus doesn't care. And the chemical environment, so these factors, temperature, pressure, and chemistry, don't matter to the radionuclide because it's a nuclear process. It's immune to these factors.
So the assumption um, is that the older the rock is, the less parent there will be and the more daughter there will be. And the ratio is, in, is the important uh, factor. Now, it's, a, it's not a bad thing that there are different half-lives for different radionuclides right? because um, of the conditions that are required to give you the best estimate. Also, if the daughter is radioactive, the half-life of the daughter is always different than the parent. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter. You just have to determine that. And take that into consideration when you're trying to use that parent to date a rock. Okay, as the parent decays, the proportion of the parent decreases and the proportion of the daughter increases, uh, repeat myself. And it might look like this, right? If we start off with this much parent and no daughter, that's the ideal situation. Then after one half-life, you've lost um, half of your parent and replaced it with whatever the daughter is. And then after another half-life, you've got uh, a quarter, uh, another half or a quarter of the original. And then three, you've got uh, an eighth. So the ratio is this, one over two to the N, right? So if you start off with a certain amount, then after one half-life, you're going to have half of it. After two half-lives, you're going to have a quarter. After three half-lives, you're going to have an eighth. And after four half-lives, you're going to have a sixteenth of that amount. Okay, the rock clock. <laughs> That's a good name for it. Um, that's the radionuclide that's in the rock that indicates how long it is, how old it is. All right, there are certain conditions that must be met or conditions that must be considered to give you the best estimate of the age of the rock. Condition zero. Right? This one's not in your book. That's why I called it zero because they start off with one. Condition zero. We have to assume that the half-life is constant over the lifetime of the radionuclide. Now, <clears throat> we don't know whether the radionuclide uh, has a constant half-life from 4 billion years ago. The other possibility is one that I've mentioned. We may make an error in estimating the half-life of that radionuclide. If it's very old, right? A slight, a very small error now is magnified through time. So if we say the half-life is uh, 1 billion years, but the half-life is really only, it is really uh, 3 billion years, then that's going to influence the uh, outcome of estimating the age of the rock using that clock. That's a not, not an insignificant condition. Um, there's another, it's not really a condition, but it's a bit of information that's useful. The change of the parent to the daughter is statistically random occurrence. Now, when you when you do um, the, um, let's see, is that one of the labs? Uh, let's see. Oops, I'm in the wrong one. Hold on a second. 
I don't want to discuss something that's not part of your Glaciers, rock cycles. Maybe what I'm discussing is a lab that you had done in 103 when we covered uh, radionuclides. Anyway. Um, this random process, you notice then, or you will notice in, in one of the other labs, is that the smaller the sample size, the more difficult it is to watch the decay. So you need a large sampling of isotopes, radioactive isotopes, radionuclides, in order to average out the statistical randomness. So the smaller the sample size gets, the less reliable the uh, dating process is. That's another way of putting it. <laughs> the fewer the parent atoms in the sample, the more erratic the decay profile. Just something to be aware of. Now, condition number one, given by the uh, authors of the book. Over the lifetime of the rock, no daughter or parent has been added or subtracted. In other words, we can't have any external influence on this clock as, as the rock is being formed and moved down in the strata or being buried further. You can't change the original composition by adding or subtracting. This, another way of, of wording it is contamination. Don't contaminate the sample. If either of the parent or the daughter nuclides are added or subtracted by any process, uh, metamorphism would be a good one, fluid movement within the rock, leaching them out, then the date obtained is not valid. And it's very difficult to account for and correct for these processes. Sometimes we can. Sometimes we can see from evidence, geologic evidence in the rock, mineralogic evidence, that there has been some change. And then we have to go to secondary procedures to uh, adjust the outcome to be more accurate. Okay, condition two. The age of the rock is reasonably close to the half-life of the parent nuclei, nuclei, radionuclide. Now, why is that? The reason for that is, if too many half-lives have transpired in the process, it may become impossible to measure the remaining parent nuclei. And the ratio is required. You have to know the ratio of the parent to the daughter. So if most of the parent's gone, then you pick the wrong nuclide, radionuclide. Or if it's only preceded a small amount, if only a small portion of the half-life transpires, then it's impossible to measure the amount of the daughter product present. So if you're at extremes, either too young or too old, then your choice of the clock uh, is not a good one. So in either case, your date is not valid. That's why very often a rock is dated using two or more clocks. Two or more different radionuclides are analyzed from the same rock. And that gives you a better estimate of the age of the sample. Okay, condition three. No daughter product was present when the rock initially formed. 
we're basing the radioactive decay upon the production of new daughters. So if you've already got daughters there, um, that tells you that that tells you the ratio is wrong. If you try to ratio the parent to the daughter, and you already had some daughter there to begin with, then that skews your results. All right, sometimes it may be possible to determine how much of the daughter nuclei was present uh, when the clock started. So you need other lines of evidence to tell you that. Um, the other possibility that's not mentioned here is that um, what if the daughter is also radioactive with a very short half-life on the order of minutes or hours or even years? If the daughter is radioactive, then as you form it, it disappears. So your ratio is wrong again. So in order to use the clock, you got to have the radionuclide there in the beginning. It has to uh, uh, have the appropriate radionuclides, ones that satisfy conditions one, two, and, and three um, are required to give you the best estimate of the age of the rock. Okay, here's an example where you have pre-existing daughters. In this case, uranium to lead is dated. There are many different isotopes of lead. Right? And we know from, from other means that we don't have time to discuss here, that the primordial ratio of lead isotopes is this, 1.4% lead 204, uh, in, in ancient rock is fixed. Uh, lead 24, 24.1% of 206, 22% of 207, 52% 208. So we know those were there at the beginning of the clock. <clears throat> we also know that 204 is never created from radioactive decay. Right? It's pre-existing. And that's good because we don't have to muddy the waters with lead as a daughter from some other process. It just is. So if we know how much this is in the rock sample, we can ratio that to the other lead isotopes and say uh, a certain amount of these other isotopes was primordial. It was there to start with. So that's subtracted from the measured amount so that now we know the actual daughter amount. Okay. It introduces a correction factor. So, for instance, here we have um, here's 204, and it's a primordial lead, right? It has, it has nothing that's radiogenic that is formed from radioactive decay. We measured 206, which comes from uh, uranium 238. We know a total amount here, but based upon the 204, we know that it should be this much more than that one, the ratio. So we know to subtract this much as primordial, and now we're only interested in the ratio of uranium-238 originally present to uh, lead-206. We can do 235 the same way, or thorium-232 the same way. That's one type of correction for the existence, the pre-existence of the daughter nuclei. So for dating the earth processes, here are some radionuclides that are useful. Going from rubidium to strontium, right? Uh, Half-life of rubidium, 87 is 47 billion years, right? 
So its useful time range is 10 million to 4.6 billion. Now that's a real stretch, right? That's a long way from near the half-life. It would be better if you're dating rock that was in the neighborhood of uh, uh, 23 and a half billion years. <laughs> but the earth isn't that old. So you have to have a very good instrumentation to do the shorter one because you're looking for just atoms of strontium-87 in a sample. Now, the question for me, well, we have others, uranium-238, right? It's useful for the similar range. Uh, uranium-235, similar range. Um, the question that occurred to me was, um, if the half-life is 47 billion years, why, does, why do we stop at 4.6 billion? Each one of them stops at 4.6 billion. Why is that? <laughs> because we believe the Earth to be only 4.6 billion years old. So who cares how much longer it is? Okay, it's that simple, it's practical. Here's some other radionuclides. Okay. So uh, potassium argon, half-life is 1.3 billion. Thorium is 14.1 billion. All right, so we were in, a, actually potassium argon would be better for these shorter ranges. And then there's also carbon-14. Carbon-14 is used for very, very, young fossils because its half-life is only 5,000 years old. So the best dating for carbon-14 would be in the neighborhood of eh, 2,300 years or thereabouts. All right. How do we measure very small amounts of these isotopes? Because you may be starting off with a, a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the parent radionuclide, right? And when it produces daughters, they're even gonna be smaller in, in amounts until they're approximately equal, right? So how do we do that? We need some very sensitive instruments. The best way to do it is with a mass spectrometer. And this is an idealized, excuse me, idealized version of a mass spectrometer. Your sample goes in here, it has to be a gas, is heated up um, and it's bombarded with electrons. You have to produce ions because only ions will respond to a magnetic field. And then we accelerate it. We accelerate the ions through these plates and collimate the beam, that is make it straight. Then we send it through a magnet. And ions bend right angles to the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is this way, right? Let's see, the ions are gonna bend right angle to it. That's why they spread out up here across this way and the magnetic field is this way. So what we know is that the, they have the same charge on the ions, but they have different masses. So the ones that bend the most, in other words, this one that bends the most is the lightest. And then this one bends the least is the heaviest. And if you calibrate your instrument with known isotopes, then you can detect uh, the radionuclides and the, the parents and the daughters of the particular uh, clock that you're using. And today's electronics are so fast, they can count individual atoms as they strike the detector. Okay, potassium argon dating. Let's use that as an example. Brings up another problem. Okay, potassium is very abundant in the Earth's crust. 
that's good. And we can um, separate out the radionuclide that decays into, this potassium 40, decays into argon 40. So they have the same mass, they're just different elements. There's a very small percentage that's potassium 40, and it produces argon 40. Okay, that's good. And we, we can find this uh, radionuclide in lots of different rocks. Uh, some examples here, muscovite, orthoclase, biotite, hornblende, and others. So we have to measure potassium 40 and argon 40. One of the major limitations of this dating procedure is argon. Argon is an inert gas. And gases penetrate through pore systems very easily. Right? So as the argon is formed, it could leak out of your rock. Right? Especially if the rock is undergoing further compression and metamorphosis as it heats up, then you drive all the argon off. Your dates may not be valid for the dating the age of the rock. So what you may be dating actually is when was the last time that the rock was heated? <laughs> the rock was heated and expels this gas, then your clock starts again at that point. How about rubidium and strontium dating? Rubidium is, is fairly common in the crust. Right, so that's good. Uh, it forms strontium-87. Um, problem is, there are significant portions of strontium-87 that are primordial. And you need corrections. So you've got to figure out how much was there to begin with of strontium-87. Um, very often, you use both of them as a check, right? and hopefully you'll be able to um, uh, correlate them, so to speak, so that they give you a better estimate. Now, how we figure out the primordial content of strontium-87 is another question. Okay, so let's uh, take an example. Say you have... Uh, Uranium-235 is, is the parent, and it, it uh, uh, decays to lead-207. And now you know the ratio of 235 to 207 as 1 to 3. So how much of the 235 remains? 25%. 25% is one quarter of the original. One quarter of the original says what? Uh, one quarter of the original says what? N equals two. That means two half-lives. Two half-lives have occurred, right? So what's the half-life? The half-life is seven is um, 7.04 times 10 to the eighth years, right? So we know two half-lives have, have occurred, right? So two times that is 1.408 times 10 to the ninth years, right? 10 to the ninth is a billion. So it's 1.4 billion years old, that rock. Okay. These are simple problems. Where we're using um, whole number ratios, right? Half, quarter, eighth, sixteenth. Then it, it's simple process of multiplying times how many uh, what's the half-life times how many half-lives? Right. 
Those are simple problems. Uh, here's another one. If the ratio now is one to seven, what does that mean? Well, if it's one to seven, how many half-lives occurred? Well, one to seven is 12 and a half percent of the original. The ratio of, of one to seven is one eighth, right? The total is eight, one plus seven. So if the ratio is one to seven, then there's only um, an eighth left over. That means three half-lives, which means that rock is two billion years old. Okay. Uh, the trick to this one is recognizing what does one to three mean? What does one to seven mean? The ratio uh, is one to seven or one to three. That means one part of this one and three parts of that one. So the total is four parts. So it's one quarter. Or one to seven is one part of this one and seven of that one, which means a total of eight parts. So it's one to eight or one eighth. Now let's look at carbon dating. Carbon dating has been used um, to date any fossils that were once living. Uh, the procedure itself was developed in 1950 by Willard Libby. And in fact, he got the Nobel Prize for it in 1960. So what's required to do carbon dating? Well, the parent nucleus, the parent radionuclide is carbon-14, which is radioactive. And when it decays, uh, it decays to uh, nitrogen. That's the daughter's, the daughter nucleus, the daughter isotope. It's the only one that can be used to date um, living system, uh, to date once living organisms. And the next slide, I'm gonna show you why. The half-life is 5,730 years. Um, so how old can we date something? I mean, how useful is it for dating once living organisms. Well, it's limited. Uh, I thought I had a slide on that one. Coming up quick. Uh, it's limited to uh, fossils that are 75,000 years or younger. So that's about, 20 times the half-life. All right, let's go back. I skipped a bunch of stuff. Here we go. So why is it that we can only use carbon-14 to date living systems? Well, it begins with the formation of carbon-14. How is carbon-14 produced? <clears throat> carbon-14 in the atmosphere is produced by bombardment of cosmic rays from outer space, way, way, way up in the upper uh, stratosphere. You get these cosmic rays that free neutrons from other atoms. The neutrons then impact uh, nitrogen-14, and they produce carbon-14 as a product. Okay? So the carbon-14 is radioactive and it's incorporated into carbon dioxide, uh, either directly reacting with oxygen in the atmosphere, which it can do, or by uh, microbial activity, it can take uh, carbon and, and uh, produce carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide then is taken up by plants. Right. taken up by plants and incorporated into their living system, into their cells. <clears throat> right. Most of it is non-radioactive carbon, 
but uh, one in a trillion carbon atoms is carbon-14. And that is incorporated along with the other carbon because <coughs> they are essentially identical in their chemical behavior. The plant doesn't care whether it's carbon-12 or carbon-14. And uh, living matter has been determined to have a, a consistent um, amount of carbon-14 in their makeup. And we believe that um, it's been fairly constant for uh, thousands of years. So what happens? The organism is constantly pulling carbon in for plants, taking carbon dioxide and water in and making uh, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, whatever, and uh, expelling oxygen as a waste product. So as long as the a plant is alive, it's taking in this carbon at a, at a given rate, incorporating it with the same ratio as 14 to 12, as always, when it dies, it stops bringing carbon in. Right? So the dead material, the dead biological material now starts the clock. It's not taking any new in. So whatever's there starts to decay. It continues to decay. It's not being replaced anymore. And this occurs for animals too, because animals eat the plants. So they get the same ratio of carbon uh, 12, uh, carbon-14, as uh, the, the plants have. When they die, then the clock starts. Okay. Um, typically, what occurs is carbon-14 and carbon-12 are measured. And uh, since we know the ancient ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14, then the new ratio is an indicator of how much has decayed. All right, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, past 75,000 years, the amount of carbon-14 present is too small to measure. So the um, Age beyond 75,000 years is, is worthless. It's undetermined. But um, remember when we were doing those um, unit increments of uh, uranium, right? One half life, two half life, three half life. Well, suppose it's not that clean. Suppose you've got somewhere in between. The ratio puts you uh, between two half-lives. How are you going to figure that one? Well, this formula will help you. So what you need to know is how much parent radionuclide remains. That's N sub T. And N sub zero is how much parent radionuclide was at the beginning. That's N zero. You multiply that by this factor, one half raised to the power of the ratio of the time present, time before present, and the half-life. So if you know the ends and you know the half-life, then you solve for the T. That's the time before present. Okay. The trick is knowing how much radionuclide there was to begin with. That's the key. Then you can ratio the two. All right. So when the carbon-14 uh, decays, what daughter would we be looking for? Well, the daughter of carbon-14, uh, right? Here's the way you write it, remember? There's the uh, atomic number, and there's the mass number. And when it decays, it gives you nitrogen 14 with seven protons. It also gives off a 
um, electron, a beta particle, and it gives off this one right here, which we don't need to deal with, and some energy, right? So when it decays, it makes nitrogen. Nitrogen 14, all right? Why is that not a good daughter? <laughs> because 79% <laughs> of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen 14. So when you convert uh, this radioactive carbon to nitrogen, it just goes into the mix. You can't tell which is which. There's so much nitrogen in the atmosphere that you can't pick out the uh, radiogenic nitrogen from the primordial. Right? So we have to use a different ratio. That's why we use carbon-14, carbon-12 ratio instead. All right, what are its limitations? All right. One of the limitations is that we we have to assume that the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere and therefore in the living organisms has been constant for the past 75,000 years. Right? There have been no appreciable change. Right? Unfortunately, we know that that's not the case. We now know that the amount of carbon-14 has varied over that time scale as much as 5% less or 5% more. And primarily due to the amount of solar activity and the Earth's magnetic field. So solar activity would produce uh, some cosmic rays right, that are uh, essential for producing carbon-14. And the Earth's magnetic field has varied. And the Earth's magnetic field is a protective envelope from cosmic rays. So if it strengthens, it's going to decrease the number of cosmic rays that get through to the atmosphere. And so those variables are responsible for the variable amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Um, so these slight variations have been correlated with the amounts uh, of uh, carbon-14 from uh, the bristlecone pine, which is the oldest tree on the planet that's still living. So we can take cores and measure the amounts in those cores, and we can date very accurately how old uh, those rings are that we take our samples from. Now, this is good for um, 5,000 years, and we can extrapolate some to go back to 5,000 BC, right? So the, the tree may only be uh, good to maybe 2,500 or 2,600 BC, but you can statistically extract, extrapolate a little bit further into the past. So from about 5,000 BC on, these correction factors that we developed from uh, this method uh, are reasonably reliable. And you can correct your values using those. Carbon dating has been used to date various archeological finds, not just fossils. Um, organic remains, of course, charcoal from fires, ancient fires, um, the wooden beams that, pre, that still exist in the pyramids. The Dead Sea Scrolls have been dated with carbon-14. They even did the Shroud of Turin just to see if the, the date matched with the death of Christ. It was supposed to be the shroud that covered Christ in, a, uh, in his grave. Like, I don't know what the outcome was. I suspect that it, it showed that the shroud was a phony, but I don't know that for sure. Okay, Lord Kelvin and the age of the earth. <laughs> Okay, in the middle to late 1800s, Lord Kelvin, right, the same one that invented the uh, Kelvin temperature scale, same guy. He was one of the most distinguished physicists in the world. 
and he was active with uh, the emerging field of thermodynamics. And he made essential contributions to that science. So he's well respected. What he set out to do was to determine the age of the earth. His method was to use the physics of a hot sphere and radiating its heat, not conducting its heat to anything, but radiating its heat into space over a period of time. And if the Earth were now considered to be cold, how long does it take to get there? Right? If the Earth was originally molten, how long does it take for the Earth to cool off if it's that hot? Right? So when he did that, starting in the molten state, it cooled off over time. Um, what he determined was that the Earth was about 20 to 40 million years old. Which was pretty old. I mean, in those days, um, uh, the consensus was that the Earth was young, and this was based upon Bible interpretation, of course. Um, but there were um, other indications. Geologists had their time scale. Um, based upon uniformitarianism, they believed that the Earth was much older. And um, uh, Darwinists believed that the Earth had to be older because they had done some estimations on how long it takes for one species to, uh, through, uh, I left out one of the conditions, through mutation uh, to produce a different species. So originally I said, you need to isolate a population and it has to experience mutation, that's genetic change, over a long period of time. So those three conditions must be, um, are required for uh, Darwinism to work. And the long period of time was the catch for Darwinists. The earth needed to be much, much older in order for these changes to produce the variety of species that we see in the fossil record. <laughs> Um, but they didn't make any headway initially because Lord Kelvin's reputation was so ironclad that nobody took them seriously. Okay, so um, when radioactivity was discovered in the late 19th century uh, by people, um, uh, Henri Becquerel, who was French, discovered uh, radioactivity. And then uh, Marie Curie and her husband, um, what was his name? I can't remember his first name. <clears throat> they worked with radioactivity also and isolated radionuclides, uh, several of them. And, and uh, other scientists starting, started working with it, radioactivity, and um, eventually we developed the uh, half-life system for determining the age of rocks, right? Um, now that came later, right? The, the radionuclide clocks came later. The original importance of radioactivity was that when a nucleus uh, decays, it always gives off energy, right? <laughs> okay, so if uh, there are lots of radionuclides still buried in the earth in its core, then they can produce significant amounts of energy and the earth can stay hot for much longer. So that indicates that the earth is much, much older than Lord Kelvin thought it was. Because he was just working with a molten ball. 
but um, radioactivity says that no, the earth is constantly heating from the inside due to radioactive decay. And there was a lot more heat to account for that Lord Kelvin didn't know about. Okay, so uh, estimates now are that the earth is not just 4.6 billion years, but 4.56 billion years old. So we have to round it up to the other one. And when you get that old, I mean, what's well, a few million, 100 million years? Right? Okay, there are three main lines of evidence that support this uh, more advanced age for the earth. The age of the rocks. Right? We've um, dated the rocks excuse me, dated the rocks by various means, including the, the radioactive clock method. We've also measured the age of meteorites using similar uh, techniques of radioactive decay. And then we've also done that with moon rocks. So the linchpin for these three methods is radioactive decay. Right? So any of the problems that we mentioned earlier with, with um, using um, radioactive decay as a clock apply to any of these others. Uh, there's a problem for the Darwinists. 4.56 billion years is a long time but it's still not long enough to account for the proliferation of species. It, they need a lot more time, much, much more time. 10 times, at least 10 times as much uh, age of the earth to, to, uh, for uh, evolution by these, these three rules that I gave you earlier, for that to occur to produce the species that we have today. So they've been struggling with that one for a hundred years. All right, this is just, um, it's not a quote from Darwin, but Darwin did put this in a letter to a friend. Darwin was a good scientist. He proposed his theory based on the evidence that he had, right? Uh, he took a trip around the world um, on a ship called the Beagle, HMS Beagle. He was their resident scientist. And when they stopped at uh, the Galapagos Islands off the coast of uh, Chile, or was it Peru? I think it was Peru, um, of South America. Um, he noticed some very unique species there that were found nowhere else in the world. He also did some work with uh, birds um, in his native England. And he gradually pulled these things together and proposed this theory of the origin of species, that's the name of his book, the origin of species through natural selection. And at the time, it was perfectly valid theory. But he also wrote to a friend in a letter that we have. Um, and he said that if there were not found in the fossil record, infinitesimally small changes from one fossil to the next through the fossil record, these very small changes uh, uh, from one fossil to the next, then uh, his theory would be invalid. What we have found in the fossil record was massive jumps from one rock layer to the next. One species, next species, with huge changes in their morphology and we assume their physiology. Right? So um, based on Darwin's word himself, um, I feel confident that he would have invalidated his own theory knowing what we know now through the fossil record. 
But alas, there are people that are they're massively invested in Darwinism. So they're going to hold on to it until they're dead. And unfortunately, that's what happens in sciences. Um, you get a, uh, a theory that's developed and accepted by a lot of people or proposed by someone with very uh, good credentials, with a, a good reputation, and nobody's willing to challenge it. So the only way that those theories, if they happen to be proven false, the only way that they die is for the people that advance them to die. Then that gives room for uh, new thoughts to emerge and uh, new theories, new lines of evidence. Um, unfortunately, that's the way it goes. You got to die off a generation before you can uh, make any progress in the sciences. Too often. Okay. Um, the radiometric dating techniques are good for dating igneous and metamorphic rocks. Um, They're not so good for sedimentary rocks. And we'll talk about that a little more in a few minutes. But to, to go for the, the oldest rocks, the oldest rocks contain a mineral called a zircon. It's zirconium silicon oxide. And those can be removed from the mineral, isolated from the mineral, and dated. Um, from, and, and there are other things included in that zircon, right? It's not just zirconium silicon uh, tetroxide, right? There are other things in there. The radioactive nuclides are in there buried with them. But we know that these zircons are pretty old. So we go for those. And they have been dated based upon their contents at between 4.3 and 4.4 billion years. Those are the oldest rocks on the earth. We're not gonna find anything older. Right? Other places we've located these crystals and dated the rocks, Canada, 4 billion years, Greenland, 3.8 billion, uh, South Africa, 3.4 billion. We've dated meteorites. Okay, I was going to say something else. Hold on a second. Um, if we estimate the Earth at 4.56 billion years old, right? why are these rocks only 4.3 billion years old? It's because the Earth is geologically active. And it's constantly eroding and replacing rocks. So the oldest rocks, to find them near the surface is, is difficult. That's why we only find them in these few locations. They've been uh, eroded away or subducted back into the earth and they're gone. Right? So how do we know that we think the earth is 4.56 billion years old? Well, we have to date other things that have not been geologically active. Meteorites, for instance that were saying, formed at the same time as the Earth. If we can find meteorites <coughs> and date them, <coughs> then since we believe that they were formed at the same time as the Earth and the solar system itself, then uh, their age will give us a better estimate as, as to how old the Earth actually is. And um, we can use rubidium strontium or uranium uh, lead, uh, usually both at the same time as confirmation, to date these meteorites at 4.56 billion years old. Moon rocks, right? Moon rocks have been meticulously analyzed and found uh, the oldest ones on, from the moon are 4.55 billion years old. Now, at one point in its history, the, the moon was geologically uh, active. 
but it has cooled over time. That's probably why there's there's a gap in there of, of a few million years. There are other lines of evidence that we don't have time for right now that indicate the solar system is about this old. So we, we also uh, bring all these lines of evidence together and say, yeah, we think the, the Earth is the same age as the uh, solar system, about 4.56 billion years. Right? Like I said, for, for the first several hundred million years, the Earth was molten. <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't do anything with it uh, in terms of um, radioactive dating. Over time, right, subduction in plate tectonics, weathering, metamorphism have uh, destroyed many of the ancient rocks. All right, I mentioned um, young earth interpretation earlier, right? And that's basically uh, due to an interpretation of uh, the Bible. That the earth is between five and 10,000 years old. Right? Um, sometimes geologists get sucked into this argument. They ought to stay away from it and just stick to their sciences. But some of them, you know, human nature is you, you can't live a controversy alone. Never let a crisis go on, uh, go to waste. <clears throat> Um, most lines of physical and biological evidence now indicate an old Earth. Now, like I said before, these are scientific uh, conclusions, right? And science being what it is, is never settled. We may find other lines of evidence that change that value in the future. But right now, the best evidence we have is that the earth is old. Right? And science is satisfied as long as the evidence supports the conclusions, then science has no argument. Only people argue, science doesn't argue. And um, unfortunately, um, Human nature being what it is, becomes invested in a certain perspective and will fight to the death to defend it. That's just the way humans are. Right? So just make allowances for those differences and move on with your life. Okay, just a word of caution, be on the lookout for scientific theories that have become more like religion than science. And uh, I would put Darwinism in that category. Most Darwinists are, are very, um, they're devoted to their religion. They don't want to accept any other arguments whatsoever. Right? They actually believe that Darwinism is settled science and they move on from there. And as long as there's enough money out there to support their research, it's gonna be here. All right. So we've discussed the relative geologic time scale and the absolute geologic time scale. And uh, most of the dates that we've determined with minor changes uh, from new data are uh, fairly consistent at the present time. So now we can take that uh, relative chart and put numbers on it. These uh, values are given in millions of years. So this is very small. I've, I've blown it up a little bit for the subsequent slide so it, it'd be easier to see. <clears throat> but you've got these um, uh, eons, eras, and periods, and then within the periods you have epochs, um, and the times that are associated to those 
dividing lines between the two, and then major events or uh, other types of information that can be gained from it in this uh, uh, gray area. Okay, so now we expanded the top side of that when we move backwards in time. So we start at the most recent, the Phanerozoic, Eon, Cenozoic era, the Quaternary period. And uh, we didn't mention this before, but uh, the Holocene. The Holocene epoch is the one we're in right now. Um, and the Holocene started, let's see, millions would be, uh, let's see, millions, 100,000, 10,000, about 10,000 years ago was the, when the Holocene started. That's the end of the last ice age. Right? So there's our benchmark. Um, the Pleistocene was roughly the big, uh, earliest humans. And the beginning of ice ages starting to appear at the beginning of the Pleistocene. And then you have these other Pliocene, Miocene, Oligocene, Eocene, Paleocene. These all have um, meanings, etymologies for their words. Okay. Um, and we can go back further in time and see that uh, Pennsylvanian and Mississippian, the coal forming forests were involved. First reptiles appear in this time at this time. So we go back, we get less and less complex amphibians, first land plants, right? <laughs> the first plants were all aqueous, I mean, uh, aquatic plants. Land plants started to appear about 400. Uh, 20 or 30 million years ago. Uh, the division between the Ordovician and the Silurian is uh, the breakup of the uh, super, supercontinent, Pangaea. Oh, excuse me, the Cambrian explosion marks the division between the Phanerozoic and the uh, uh, Precambrian. Eon. All right. The sedimentary rocks uh, have been primarily responsible for the establishment of relative time scale. And then we uh, infer metamorphic and igneous rock uh, ages uh, by those previously mentioned principles. But the sedimentary rocks are rarely suitable for radiometric dating, simply because they erode so easily. Right? The best radiometric dating is done for uh, metamorphic and igneous rocks. And then uh, inferences are made uh, relative to the sedimentary rocks. All right. So when we date sedimentary rocks using information from igneous primarily, <coughs> we go through a process called bracketing. We say uh, the rock the sedimentary rock <coughs> cannot be any older than this, and it can't be any younger than this. So when we use bracketing to date sedimentary rocks, we are relying upon the absolute dates that were obtained from uh, radiometric dating of igneous rocks that are in the same strata the same region as those sedimentary rocks. Right, so here's an example. Here we have uh, layers. Uh, this is obviously the youngest layer is from the Mississippian um,
So here we have um, this first layer is the youngest from the Mississippian period. And then the Devonian is older. And then we have some um, tilting. <laughs> that could be a problem of interpretation. But all of these at this level are from the Silurian. OK. So what can we learn from this? The two igneous dikes have been dated, right? the X and the Y have been dated at 400 million years old for the X and 350 million years old for the Y. Now that should be obvious because the Y obviously penetrates the X, so the X has to be older. And the radiometric dating confirms that. X is 400 million years old, Y is 350 million years old. So what can we say about the age of the Devonian stratum? labeled B, right? Well, if the igneous dike intruded, the, uh, the igneous dike intruded the Silurian, but notice that it must have been eroded partially at some point. So the Devonian was laid down after X, right? It came along after X, after erosion took down some of this material and the Devonian came along, right? So the, the Devonian has to be younger than uh, 400 million years old. We know that. Um, right, we said that. <clears throat> the Devonian is younger than 400 million years old compared to X. Right? So strata B must also be older than Y. Why? <laughs> because Y intrudes through Devonian and has been eroded, we can see here, for that. So it came in after the Devonian, and B must then be uh, older than Y. Right? So the Devonian strata is between the ages of these two, X and Y. It's between 350 and 400 million years old. So this Devonian sedimentary rock is bracketed between 350 and 400 million years. All right, so let's look at it again. What can we say about the absolute age of A, the Mississippian period? <clears throat> well, we know that A has to be laid down after B, and Y, right? So if Y is 350 million years old, Mississippian must be younger than that. Okay. From the geologic time scale, we know that the Mississippian period uh, extended from 350 to 320 million years old. Right. So that, that effectively brackets the Mississippian uh, sedimentary rock, but we can narrow it even further. It's not 360 million years old. It's 350 million years or younger. All right, so, so here's some highlights of the geologic time, and I'm, I'm going to go through these rather quickly because at the end, I've got a video that pulls everything together. 
it, it takes a few minutes to watch, but it, it's worth it because everything we've talked about is uh, mixed in to this video. And it's, it's a pretty good video, so it won't be a waste of time to watch it. The beginning, beginning of the Archean Eon, the middle subset of the Precambrian. So the Precambrian, right, is before um, the Phenerozoic, and it's subdivided. So the middle subset of that one is the uh, Archean Eon at about 4 billion years. That marks the date of the oldest earth rocks. The Proterozoic Eon began about uh, two and a half billion years ago and coincides with the formation of the North American continent. The Phenerozoic then developed uh, and started at 545 million years. So, um, We've mentioned in previous chapters, the supercontinent of Pangaea. Pangaea was just the latest supercontinent. There was one that preceded it called Rodinia. The Rodinia formed in the late Proterozoic, right? Is still in the Precambrian eon. The Pangaea was, was there and um, all of the continents, came together and we've got indicated on this chart, the, um, there's North America, we'll slap up against Antarctica at the time, <laughs> okay? All right, and there's South America and there's Africa. They did the same thing for Rodinia as they did for Pangaea, right? They, they just fit back in here like a hand in a glove. And then during the, the early Pale Paleozoic era, um, which was at the beginning of the Phenerozoic, uh, they started to break them. So we noticed earlier that the Phenerozoic Eon is divided into three eras, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Um, at the beginning of the Paleozoic, hard-shelled marine invertebrates first became abundant. This was part of the Cambrian explosion. Before that, hard-shelled invertebrates in the marine environment weren't there. They did not exist. You just had um, uh, basically worms, <laughs> soft-bodied worms. In fact, you didn't have any life on the land. It was all in the oceans. Um, and you, you get this uh, Cambrian explosion of species. That's very difficult for the uh, Darwinists to account for that. Because Darwinism says that these species should develop at a steady rate over time. And with this massive explosion of species at the beginning of the Phenerozoic, um, Darwinists can't explain it. Not, not, not very well anyway. I mean, they can explain anything. Human mind has uh, infinite capacity to rationalize any belief system. <clears throat> so the Paleozoic came to an abrupt and possibly catastrophic end at 245 million years. That would be the, several things happened. This was at the end of the Permian period. It's also the time when another supercontinent formed, right before the, the end of the Paleozoic, Pangaea was there. <laughs> and we had a great dying. We lost 90% of the species in oceans and 70% of land species. Okay, so we don't know why. 
uh, speculated there may have been an asteroid strike. It would have to have been a big one. <clears throat> but there's also evidence that um, excessive volcanic activity of the Earth itself would have contributed to um, destruction of various ecosystems. All they had to do was just belch a lot of sulfuric acid, uh, sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, and it would have formed a, uh, uh, a blanket blocking out the sun, and plants died, and animals had to go with them. During the Mesozoic era, so we had the Paleozoic era of the Phenoros, of the Phenerozoic um, eon. Now we have the Mesozoic in the middle there. And during the Mesozoic, we get the development of dinosaurs and birds. And the global climate was very mild. Right? We've already had the, the hot, steamy climate that uh, produced lots of plant material and laid down the coal beds. So the, the climate was moderating during this time. One too hot, one too cold, it's just right. We had lots of corals growing. Uh, in what is now Europe? How do we know that? Because we find evidence of corals in the mountains of Europe, in the Alps. We find corals <laughs> at uh, um, a mile high. So something else happened, right? The corals were growing, but when the mountains started to form, the corals got uplifted. Dinosaurs were common in Canada and the United States. That wasn't the only place, they were, in, they were worldwide. The Mesozoic came to a catastrophic end. At about 65 million years ago, this one was pretty certain, an asteroid strike. And I'm gonna give you the evidence in a second. At this point, 70% of the world's plants and animal species died. All the dinosaurs were gone. Well, except for maybe, um, well, we don't think that the reptiles were actually descendants of the dinosaurs simply because there's evidence that the dinosaurs were warm-blooded and all reptiles are cold-blooded. The birds are warm-blooded. So they think that maybe one line of thought says that the birds developed from dinosaurs and when the dinosaurs died off, the birds kept going. Okay, there are several lines of evidence. Uh, it's believed that the the meteor strike that occurred uh, that is to blame for this uh, uh, transition between the Cretaceous and the Cenozoic uh, occurred uh, near Chicxulub, actually off the Yucatan Peninsula. This Chicxulub uh, crater and um, the evidence is fairly strong now by several lines. Uh, both topographical and actually samples have been taken uh, deep in this area uh, by um, research vessels. And they found evidence of an asteroid strike at this location and not just an asteroid, a huge asteroid strike. It's believed that the asteroid was six miles wide. Six miles. In other words, the leading edge of that asteroid was striking the Earth when the trailing edge was still in outer space. Another line of evidence is there's a, a, a boundary layer of rock between uh, the Cretaceous and the Cenozoic. It's called the KPG boundary. used to be called the um, used to be called the KT boundary.
And you may see that indicated in, in old drawings. They would call it the KT. It's the same thing as the KPG. Anyway, this boundary was discovered by uh, Lewis and Walter Alvarez. They were a father and son team that were uh, geologists and working in Northern Italy. And they located this boundary uh, layer, it's very narrow, but dark. And they sampled it because they hadn't seen it before and took it back to the US and, and analyzed it. Um, oh, there it is. Uh, KT stands for Cretaceous Tertiary Boundary. Right. Now it's um, uh, uh, K for Cretaceous. Cretaceous Paleogene is what that means. So instead of Tertiary now, which is renamed Paleogene. What they noticed was the clay was rich in this one element, iridium. And you can find it on your periodic table. Iridium, it's, um, I can see it from here. Um, atomic number 77, it's a transition metal. This iridium was found, uh, is found at significant levels in meteorites and comets for that matter. But it's not very common on the, on the earth. So they speculated that maybe it was due to a massive meteor strike because they started looking at other places around the globe and they found this same layer in the same place, the correlated layer everywhere on the earth. <clears throat> it was a worldwide event. They also found um, in this layer spherules, which are structures that are also found on the moon as a consequence of its impact craters. They were identified and correlated with the impact craters on the moon. We find them in this layer uh, on Earth. So they say, okay, that's due to a meteorite impact. They also found in this layer uh, a special type of quartz. It's called shocked quartz. It has a particular structure that I couldn't personally identify, but a uh, trained geologist can identify it uh, under the microscope, shocked quartz. This shocked quartz is evidence of a meteorite impact. So these three lines of evidence say that to form this thick of a layer over the entire globe had to be a massive um, impact. And it threw tons and tons and tons and tons a material into the atmosphere that settled over the earth and was later buried. Okay. Well, not only that, they found soot in this layer, which indicated extensive fires. So the heat of impact of this meteorite set the world on fire. Right? It had so much energy that um, it started forest fires everywhere, uh, grass fires and forest fires, right? Embers were sent up into the atmosphere. They came down and, and started fires wherever they landed. It wasn't until 1990 that this location, this uh, Chicxulub crater was located off the Yucatan Peninsula. So there's evidence uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and there's evidence in the Yucatan for this as the strike and the dating of the material is consistent with an impact at 65 million years ago. Okay. So the Cenozoic era, which is part of the, um, well, still Phenozoic, the Cenozoic era followed the Mesozoic. And its dividing line was the disappearance of all these species. And the appearance then subsequently of mammals. Right? So within a few million years, you get the first primates showing up in the fossil record. And there's your 
And, and, and this um, chart calls it the KT boundary, right? but it's strictly speaking the KPG boundary now because it was renamed. <clears throat> Our present period is the quaternary period. <clears throat> so the Cenozoic is divided into the Paleogene, which is the, the origin of the KPG boundary, uh, followed by the Neogene and then the Quaternary. And the Quaternary started here with the beginning of glaciation. I won't say any more about the appearance of man. The genus Homo. Um, so, the Pleistocene epoch, remember these periods are divided into epochs. The Quaternary is our interest because it's the most recent, and the two epochs uh, that make up the Quaternary are the Pleistocene, the older one, and the newest one, the Holocene. And like I said before, the Holocene is marked by the disappearance of the last uh, glaciation period, the last ice age. Okay, uh, we're just about done uh, and ready for the video. The geologic time in perspective simply says that if we put all the Earth's history on a, a year long calendar, right, January 1st would be when the Earth formed. Then by the end of January, you got oceans. And then into February, you start getting uh, evidence of life, single celled organisms. And it goes on through March and April, May, June, all the way through here. And what you notice is that um, it wasn't until, uh, let's see, the last day of December is when humans appeared, right? So we haven't been here very long, according to this calendar. Recorded history is even shorter. All right, so I've got this video and then we'll be, we'll be done with it. Um, it's about uh, 12 minutes long. So here we go. The tale of life on Earth has been unfolding for about 4 billion years. And we humans are just the last word on the last page of that story, at least so far. And the vast stretches of time that are covered by the history of life can be hard for us to fathom. We rack our brains trying to imagine what a few hundred years looks like, let alone billions of years. And like speaking for myself, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast this morning. So to help us really appreciate the full expanse of time, scientists have turned to the rocks. By looking at the layers beneath our feet, geologists have been able to identify and describe crucial episodes in life's history from bursts of evolutionary diversity to disastrous extinction events. These key events of new life and sudden death frame the chapters in the story of life on Earth. And the system that we use to bind all these chapters together is the geologic timescale. First, let's talk about the history of geologic time itself, because figuring out how to read history in rocks was not easy. For much of human history, of course, we had no idea how old the Earth was or what actually happened in deep time or what happened in what order. But in 1669, Danish scientist Nicholas Steno published the first laws of stratigraphy, the science of interpreting the strata or layers of rock in Earth's outer surface. Steno argued that the layers closer to the surface must be younger than the layers below them. So the farther down you dig, he thought, the older the fossils are that you find there. Sounds legit, right? But in Steno's day, when some people thought that fossils had literally fallen from the sky for some reason, this was a pretty revolutionary idea. Building on Steno's ideas, Italian geologist Giovanni Arduino went a step further and began naming the layers of rock. In the 1760s, Arduino studied the Italian Alps, organizing their layers based on their depth and composition. The lowest layers of metamorphic and volcanic rocks he called their primary layer. 
Above those were hard sedimentary rocks, which he called secondary, and the top layers of softer alluvial deposits he named tertiary and quaternary. But because rock layers don't appear in the same order all over the world, there is no way for geologists to compare rocks from one location to another. Without a way to compare strata, there could be no universal time scale. Finally, in 1819, English geologist William Smith figured out the solution to this problem. Fossils. By comparing the remains of ancient organisms from different rock formations, Smith could match their ages regardless of how far apart they were. For example, Smith realized that fossils of many early species of trilobites are found below ammonite fossils, which are in turn below certain kinds of shellfish. So any place in the world where you find these first trilobites, you know that you're looking at rock that's older than when ammonites lived. And even in the most ancient rocks that have little or no evidence of life, scientists can still look for signs of the very earliest major geologic events like when continents first formed, and even when the Earth itself cooled and solidified. Thanks to the work of early geologists like Steno, Arduino, and Smith, modern scientists have used these and other clues to create what we now call the Geologic Timescale, or GTS. The GTS has been reworked many times to reflect the latest knowledge of Earth's history, and today it's organized into five subgroups, eons, eras, periods, epochs, and ages. Organizing time in increments like this allows us to ask questions about history on different scales. In the largest increments, like eons and eras, we can ask the biggest of big picture questions, like, was there life on Earth at this time? If there was, what did it look like? Did it live in the water or on land? This is the kind of top-level view we're going to take today. But the smaller increments of time, like periods and epochs, help us take a tighter focus and ask more specific questions. Like, what was the climate like during this window of a few million years? And how did life around the world adapt to it? We'll be talking about those in more detail in future episodes when we talk about each era, period by period. Okay, so let's get the biggest of big picture views of Earth's history right now by taking a tour of all the eons and eras in the GTS. Eons are the largest slices of time, ranging from a half billion to nearly two billion years long, and the earliest eon is known as the Hadean. It begins with the very formation of the Earth itself, around 4.6 billion years ago, and ends four billion years ago. And this is the only eon that doesn't have any fossils, because back then, the world was just hell. Named after the Greek underworld Hades, the Hadean lived up to its name. The planet was racked by volcanic activity, cosmic bombardments, raging storms, and temperatures that were at times hot enough to melt rock. But even in this searing wasteland, life may have been able to form. While no fossils have been found from this eon, small amounts of organic carbon have been discovered in Hadean rocks that some experts think is evidence of the earliest life. These first organisms were tiny and single-celled, but they were eventually able to shape the future of the entire planet, so their appearance is the one major benchmark of this eon. The Hadean was brought to an end by the cooling of the crust of the Earth, setting the stage for the continents to eventually form. And this cooling marked the beginning of the next phase, the Archean Eon, which ran from 4 billion to 2.5 billion years ago. Named for the Greek word for origin, the Archean was once thought to be when the first signs of life appeared. But at the very least, it's fair to say it was the first time that life flourished, forming mats of microbes in the primordial seas. The fossils that these microbes left behind are called stromatolites, or sometimes stromatoliths. And the very oldest of them, like those found in Western Australia, date from the Archean. During this time, the atmosphere was mostly carbon dioxide, but the appearance of cyanobacteria was about to change all that. Then, 2.5 billion years ago, the Archean gave way to the Proterozoic Eon, meaning earlier life. And around this time, photosynthetic bacteria, along with some multicellular forms of life, spewed tons of oxygen into the atmosphere. This probably wiped out most of the anaerobic life on Earth, but it cleared the path for crucial new organisms, including the ancestral eukaryotes, whose cells each had a nucleus and organelles wrapped up in membranes. Eukaryotes developed into the first really big, complex, and sometimes kinda weird forms of life, such as the frond-like carnea and the plate-shaped Dickinsonia. These new, larger organisms quickly diversified, and by 541 million years ago, we were at the doorstep of the next and current eon, the Phanerozoic. Its name means visible life, and the Phanerozoic was when life really became obvious. This is the eon that's home to trees, dinosaurs, newts, aardvarks, us humans, basically life as we know it. Whew, how are you holding up? You doing okay? We've covered about three and a half billion years already. Just got another half billion to go, and then we're home free. Okay, now from here, it's best to explore the Phanerozoic Eon through its eras, the next level down in the divisions of time. This will let us explore more recent history in greater detail. The first era of our current eon is the Paleozoic Era, which began 541 million years ago. This chapter was defined by the diversification of visible life, and it started with a bang, actually an explosion, the Cambrian explosion. This rapid growth in diversity and complexity in the world's oceans is such a huge deal in the history of life that all the eons that came before it, the Hadean, the Archean, the Proterozoic, they're all collectively known as the Precambrian. At the start of the Paleozoic, over about 25 million years, the fossil record suddenly reveals the appearance of complex animals with mineralized remains, you know, hard parts. 
shells, exoskeletons, that kind of thing. And the very first of these new animals to become truly widespread were the trilobites. They were so common all over the world that they've been used as index fossils for the Paleozoic era for centuries, ever since the days of William Smith. But the trilobites soon had competition. Fish developed teeth and jaws and came to dominate the seas, including the first sharks and armored giants known as placoderms. Meanwhile, the land, which had been barren since the formation of continents back in the Archean, was finally being populated first by plants and then by arthropods. By 370 million years ago, entire ecosystems had developed on primeval continents. Soon after, the earliest amphibians evolved and hauled themselves out of the water, leaving their first vertebrate footprints in the mud. 299 million years ago, the supercontinent of Pangaea had formed, with an enormous desert at its center. This desert was quickly populated by the ancestors of what would eventually become reptiles and mammals, which could thrive in dry conditions, unlike amphibians. But this time of incredible growth couldn't last forever, and instead, the Paleozoic era ended in cataclysm. 252 million Million years ago, 70% of land vertebrates and 96% of marine species disappeared from the fossil record, including survivors of previous extinctions, like our friends the trilobites. I still miss those guys. The event known as the Great Dying was the most severe extinction in our planet's history, but its exact cause is still unclear. A possible meteorite impact off the coast of South America might be one clue. And in Siberia, layers of basalt show that massive volcanic eruptions covered large swaths of Pangaea and lava. Both of these incidents coincided with the end of the Paleozoic, and it seems more than likely that the extinction had many causes. In any case, the Paleozoic may have begun as a chapter defined by an explosion of life, but it ended in nearly absolute death. It took millions of years for life to recover, but when it did, a new world, the Mesozoic era, had arrived. This is often called the Age of Reptiles, and with good reason. Right from the start of the Mesozoic, reptiles were incredibly successful. This is when they took some of their most famous forms, like dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and a variety of marine species. In fact, all of the non-avian dinosaurs lived only in the Mesozoic, so they remain one of the best index fossils of this era. And many modern groups of organisms also evolved in the shadows of the reptiles, like mammals, frogs, bees, and flowering plants. But the Mesozoic era came to an end 66 million years ago with yet another episode of devastation, this time known as the Cretaceous Paleogene or KPG extinction event. Like all mass die-offs, the KPG had many causes, but probably the biggest of them was a giant asteroid that struck the Earth, sending enormous amounts of ash into the atmosphere, blocking out sunlight, and creating a vicious cold snap across the planet. Without the sun's energy, entire plant communities died, and the animals that relied on those plants perished with them. Evidence of this impact can be found in a layer of iridium and rocks dating to the end of the Mesozoic. Iridium is an element that's rare on Earth, but very common in asteroids and comets. And a giant impact crater in the Gulf of Mexico, whose age matches the date of this extinction, has become the smoking gun for the asteroid hypothesis. The victims of the KPG extinction were some of the biggest reptiles of the land, sea, and sky, including all of what we now call the non-avian dinosaurs. Birds, of course, survived the cataclysm, making them the last surviving lineage of the dinosaurs. Okay, we have 66 million years to go, and that's the last major extinction event that we have to talk about. I thought you might want to freshen up, so I bought these pre-moistened towelettes. It's going to... You have some iridium here on this side, on your forehead, other side. With all the great reptiles gone, the smaller animals that remained were able to eke out a living in the next era, the Cenozoic. This is our era, in more ways than one. It's the era that we're in today, and it also marks the rise of the mammals. Soon after the KPG extinction, the climate warmed, and jungles stretched across the planet. Mammals quickly recovered in this hothouse world, and by 40 million years ago, most of the mammal groups that we recognize had come about, like whales, bats, rodents, and primates. But starting around 34 million years ago, the climate began to shift again. This time, ice caps started to grow at the poles, taking up much of the planet's water. And these drier conditions created a new habitat, the grassland, where ancestral horses and antelope were hunted by the first cats and dogs. It was also in these grassy plains, seven million years ago, that a species of ape called Sahelanthropus became the first known primate to walk upright. 2.6 million years ago, the ice caps expanded even more, and the Earth entered a glacial period. This is the one you hear referred to as the Ice Age. Over the course of these last several million years, most modern life forms that we know about developed and thrived, alongside giants like mammoths, ground sloths, and saber-toothed cats. Once again, though, this era of diversity came to a morbid end. Starting around 15,000 years ago, the climate began to warm up, and over the next few thousand years, many of the giant fauna went extinct. By 11,700 years ago, the last major glaciation was over, and modern humans inhabited nearly all the corners of the globe. But how big a role we played in the extinction of the so-called Ice Age megafauna is hotly debated. Regardless, there's no escaping the fact that our species has shaped the Earth to its will since then. Like cyanobacteria and the dinosaurs before us, we've had a huge impact on habitats, other organisms, and the biosphere itself. And as we've learned today, Today, it's the most dominant forms of life that define each phase of deep time. So even though our time on this planet amounts to the last word on the last page of the story of life, we are the authors of the next chapter. One day the epoch of humans may be detected by the marks we make on the land, the traces of our cities and farms, 
and our very bodies will be the index fossils of this time. No matter how our chapter ends, we get to be characters in a truly amazing story. Thanks for joining me on this epic or epoch journey through geologic time. Now, what do you want to know about the story of life on Earth? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to go to youtube.com slash eons and subscribe. And the fun doesn't end here, so do yourself a favor and check out some of our sister channels from PBS Digital Studios. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that's it for chapter 24 and for physical science 102. And I appreciate you joining me for this semester.